chapter one on how to fight racism, Jamar Tisby writes, growing up, I went to a Catholic elementary school, even though I wasn't Catholic. And in fifth grade, I played basketball, even though I was terrible, a terrible basketball player. But I lived just outside of Chicago in the 1990s when the Bulls basketball team was on their NBA championship winning streak and Michael Jordan was on his way to becoming the GOAT. I mean, I wasn't into sports compared to my friends, but I definitely had this life-size poster of Jordan, six foot six inches tall, that I got from some car dealership where you could stand next to him and see how you measured up. I was short, still am. And back then, everyone wanted to be like Mike. And if you were black like me, and still am (laughs) black, there was this expectation that you were good at basketball. But me, in fifth grade, I was always the last one off the bench. The other kid who was my same height, only white instead of black, was the second to last off the bench. At the time, I thought it was embarrassing. Black kids are supposed to be good at basketball. But here's this white kid who's the same size as I am, and he's better than I am. And I felt like I was somehow not black enough, like I was failing my race or whatever. But mixed in with that was this feeling like, why should people expect me to be good just because I'm black. And that's where he kicks off. Let me welcome to the show. He's a historian on race and religion, author of How to Fight Racism, Young Readers Edition, Jamar Jamar Tinsby. Welcome to the Karen Hunter Show. Jamar Tinsby. Always good to be here. Thank you for reading that excerpt. It brings a smile to my face. (laughs) I I hope I didn't butcher it um, because when I got to that line, the expectation that people grow up with based on the, the mythology and the the baked in anti-blackness that has been part of this, you know, that you're supposed to be good. You're supposed to be better than these people. These people are coming and they're ruining our neighborhood, our country. So how do you, how do you fight it? I mean, it's baked into the soil. It is. It really is. It's part of our national story. As you mentioned, it's part of our mythology. Um, But as a kid, you don't quite have that understanding. You're just absorbing these messages. And so for me at that age, it was just sort of this visceral instinct, this gut feeling like I'm being made to feel guilty or ashamed of something that in principle shouldn't even be a factor. Uh, the only way I began to, to learn my way uh, to, to lean into a better story, honestly, one of the most powerful things was learning history. And so even this book, How to Fight Racism, Young Readers Edition, a good 20% of the book is just the basics of this nation's racial history that so often is hidden, shrouded, deliberately obfuscated, not only from children, but from adults. And I can't even tell you how many times I myself, as well as other adults have said, I never knew. So maybe we can interrupt that process in this generation. That seems to be a constant refrain. Yesterday, we had a brother on, a Howard PhD student who uh, discovered the Green Book, <laughs> you know, uh-huh. and uh, it was the 19, I think 1931 uh, edition. And he was like, what? You know, how come I didn't learn this in school? And I'm hearing that a lot since doing for the last two years in class with Carr on Saturdays. It's like I sit there and I'm like, how did I not know? any of this stuff. I went to good schools. I went to the same Catholic schools you went to probably uh, in, my, in Jersey, um, not being Catholic. And you, and you realize the miseducation is so insidious because it's on purpose. Yeah. Yeah. It's, on purpose. It, 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 it's, it's such a convoluted interconnected thing. So, so if, if, if we get psychological on it, there is a shame on the part of many white people to discover this history some of them don't know right and then when when they find out it's such an identity crisis and i I, it it, it's understandable from a human perspective right but but this is what prevents them from digging deep into that history and and then on another level the way we've messed up i used to be a sixth grade teacher and a middle school principal and and the way we've messed up our our education system it is so standardized test centric especially in the schools that are least well-resourced, most underfunded, 
you don't have time to teach this stuff. I taught social studies and I would have loved to dig into this history, but no, you got to move on to the next thing. You got to do the test prep. You got to get, you know, all the, the, the material that is geared directly to the test so they can score better. So you can get more money to adequately fund the schools that were underfunded in the first place. It's, it's, it's very messed up. Let's, let's dial back. Um, and I know Cena, you want to get in. It's definitely Jamar Tisby is here. Um, when did this happen? Because I feel like, so I teach college kids and I mess them up every semester because I'm like, you, there's nothing that you're going to be able to memorize to do well in this class. Yeah. And every class, we're going to have a conversation and I want to, I'm going to go to each and every one of you and I want to know what you think about this, Ooh. whatever topic it is. We're going to talk about Ukraine. We're going to talk about George Floyd, whatever's going on in the world. We're going to start the first 20, 30 minutes of class, and we're going to all have a conversation. I may play a daily, uh, the daily podcast from the New York Times. I'm going to play 10 minutes of that. Mm -hmm. We're going to have a discussion about it because they have, they don't know how to not regurgitate and it freaks them out. So how am I doing in class? No, don't worry about your grade. It's the story arc. So whatever you do in the beginning, all I care about is how you end. So show up every day in class and be prepared to have a conversation and let's reprogram your mind away from memorization and start to tap into like, what do I really think and believe? And why do I believe that? So yes. when did this start? Jamar tends to be where they, because in, in school, I had teachers, I had a teacher, fifth grade teacher to, that had us watch Roots. And then we had to come in and talk about it. Fifth grade, 10 year old watching Roots. We had Whoa. to talk about it in, in okay. class, what we felt and thought. And then we, she went through the history in the fifth grade, Miss Johnson, okay, to this day, okay. my best favorite teacher of all time, made me want to be a teacher. Where do we go wrong here? I don't think she could have survived in today's system. Right, right. We, so, so many places. So I, I'm, I'm a historian, but ed policy is not necessarily my my, my I know, thing. I know. We're just um, having a stop. We're just having a conversation because you know some very things. good. I just, so, it's, so, like, it's like people hold on. I see the people come on here and they start pontificating and getting into their, their, their trick bag of things that they know how to do. Yeah, this ain't that like my I'm students, just, <laughs> like take it down and let's have a conversation because, you know, some things people staying in their lane and not trying to, you know, Stop. pontificate this country drive. Let's driving. go. Let's just, go. Hit that reckless light driver. Pole. I like it. Yeah. Come OK, on. I mean, from a historical perspective, it's, it's it's very simple on one hand. What many states tried to do, particularly during the Jim Crow era, is fund two separate public education systems. You take the state of Mississippi, where I got my PhD from the University of Mississippi. It tried to have a completely separate education system for black kids and another one for white kids. And of course, they said, oh, separate but equal. Obviously, it was never equal. And then on top of that, you layer the fact that it's the poorest state in the union. So they weren't even adequately going to be able to fund one public education system. Now they're going to pretend like they're going to fund two. So the resources were never there. Then on top of that, for white students, the, the insidious part of segregation was not only the hoarding of resources, it was the isolation of knowledge. So that you had all of these white kids growing up thinking that theirs was the only possible reality, that anything they heard from black people or other people of color or anybody who wasn't them just wasn't even in the, the universe of possibilities. So that's one factor. And then because of this historic inequity, which didn't go away, obviously, with Brown v. Board, you know very well that in many ways it disempowered Black educators when they desegregated schools because principals were put out of their job, teachers were fired or demoted, all of those kinds of things. Um, and there was then, again, this separation of of people uh, and the hoarding of resources, which they tried to fix in the 90s and the early 2000s with no child left behind and all of these standards, which don't even make sense on their face because you're punishing poorly funded schools, poorly resourced schools for not performing at the same level as well-resourced schools. And then you're punishing them with less funding or more oversight instead of more freedom and more funding. So all of these things combine into a toxic mix. So 866-801-8255, we talked a little bit about police funding at the top of the show. Um, I covered education on the editorial board of the Daily News for four years, and we did a whole thing because New York has the largest budget because it has the most kids. And what I found is that Black kids, in particular Black boys, 
there's more funding for them because they are more likely to be classified. So it's three times the budget for them. So schools like to classify black boys in particular as special ed so they can get more funding for them. Where So where's the money go? Like the police. We got this huge budget, but no results. How does this right. well, how do you keep getting the money? And it's just one. I feel like it's a scam. So how I, I watched Marvel Collins do something in Chicago, Illinois. You're from Illinois. Yes. Taking kids from some of the worst areas of Chicago, teaching them philosophy, <laughs> Socrates and stuff, all kinds of things. I think she had like a 99 percent go to college rate uh, mm-hmm. at the time. Marvel Collins, a great educator with not a lot of resources. Right. So right. what do you well, how, what money do my mama went to Lucy Lane High School in Augusta, Georgia se- during segregation to this day? They still they still like last reunion. They have a teacher that's still alive. I think she's like oh, 99. Wow. They still stay in touch. They still travel together. J- Jesse Norman went to her school like they're brilliant people that came out of this segregated, poor books, less resources, all of that community, though, community. Right. propel them to success that's right how much money do you need to fund a school really you are principal my... <laughs> well, um it, you know one of my one of my early mentors is a teacher who uh when i started teaching she had already been teaching 30 plus years her name was betty sue sanders and she said a good teacher can teach with a stick and a plot of dirt meaning it doesn't take many resources. It takes, it takes an attitude and a knowledge and a belief in kids, uh, especially poor black kids, that they can do anything. So that's fundamental, right? And that goes back to the old, old days when after the Civil War, one of the most vigorous activities that black people undertook was to start schools and to get their education. In many ways, the fact that we even have a public education system was due to the cry of uh, recently freed Black people who wanted their children to learn to read and write. And they did with far less than we have now. So it was, it's in us, it's in our lineage, it's in our heritage to be able to do much with little. But that shouldn't prevent us from demanding adequate resources. But she asked, where does all that money go? I think part of the problem is that money is being poured in to fix a problem instead of preventing the problems from occurring in the first place, uh, which takes far more investment and far more. The house, right? Building a house is the great analogy. If you start with a firm, solid, even foundation, then it's a lot easier uh, to build a solid structure. But if you start with a flawed foundation, then no matter what you build on top of it, eventually you're going to have to knock it down and start over. And that's what's happening in so many cases, in so many of our systems, education and beyond. Uh, Jamar, there's... You kind of mentioned something earlier. Oh, but by the way, uh, I had Mr. Ross in sixth grade that uh, had us watch <laughs> The Roots. Uh, the oh, whole Roots? Thing. What yeah, is yeah, The yeah. Roots? That's the oh, band? The, 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 the Roots. Did, you were watching Quest Love and them <laughs> and Black Thought? The Roots, whatever. <laughs> the sixth grade? Hey, you know, we all love Rating Rainbow. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, uh, you know, you were talking about the, uh, you know, the identity crisis that white people kind of have when they start learning about this, this history and stuff like that. Um, w- and then Karen, you kind of mentioned like the discussion that you have with your students and stuff. I feel like that discussion element is really what's missing at so many points. And like, whenever I try to share information with folks and I see them kind of like glaze over at this, like, oh no, he's going to blame me or he's going to like call me racist. He's going to. No, we're just talking. And I think, how do we, how do you think? Because I think if we're talking about how do we battle racism, we got to start thinking about how do we actually have that discussion where we're not just, when we say something, uh, the other person's not just going to feel like, they're just going to run away and just like, how do we help them? You know, and I'd say this with, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, I pause a bit. How do we help them not feel so sensitive about it? Is that, is that crazy? (laughs) Yeah, I, 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 I get what you're saying. I think it's actually a really, really important point. And I really dislike the way certain words and phrases get co-opted so that you can't use them anymore. And, and one example is safe spaces. Like that's a, that's, a, that's a helpful term when it's understood in context. So what you're saying, I really do think 
people need safe spaces to get race wrong in the mm. learning journey. Yeah. So, so, so it's not just to express racist ideas. There's plenty of shows and podcasts and YouTubers who do that. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is in some sort of educational pedagogical setting where you don't have to have it all right and all figured out. And, and, and this goes across the board for people of different races and ethnicities, but especially for white people who, who, yes, there are the rabid racists out there, but there's a lot of folks who just have bad ideas and are afraid to speak up and say, this is what I've been taught. This is what I believe. What's right? What's wrong? How can I figure this out? Where are those spaces? Right. Yeah. That, and, and how do we cultivate and craft them, especially at these younger ages, when when we can get it before those ideas have metastasized? So I think that's a critical point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that, one thing that happened to me was you know, I remember with George Floyd, yeah, that that whole thing happened. I had um, a client that I work with and she was like, I don't know what is the problem. I feel terrible. You know, I don't see color. I'm I'm colorblind. It's 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 just I, I just don't see it. And I was like, all right. We are going to have a very thoughtful conversation. Yeah. You are a very large client. We are going to make this work. I am going to gently guide you to the light here. And you have to do that. For me, it was like a different, you know, there's a power dynamic there and all, all that. But I think that was, I mean, I know she felt comfortable making that mistake. And because it wasn't just like, she didn't, she didn't think it was a mistake. She didn't think it was a mistake. Exactly. She didn't know it was a mistake. She had no idea. And that was the thing. And I think that's what so many people don't realize is that they are making a mistake that they are stuck. They had never been educated on that in a thoughtful way. And they think if they do get educated, it's going to come down with like a hammer as opposed with me, which is like a gentle brush. Velvet gloves. Velvet yeah. gloves. <laughs> yes. Against your face with a microchip theory, in your finger. Yes. My theory, especially with, um, I was going to say politics, but, but there are so many people who are just gone so far. I don't know, but maybe in business, maybe in large corporations, maybe in nonprofits, the, the CEOs, the presidents, the executive, whatever's of these organizations are often the ones who sort of, they, 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 uh, delegate this kind of racial awareness, this kind of, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion work to, to some component in their organization but they themselves or, out, or outside or outsource it yes completely but they themselves never really engage in the work and and but 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 here's the organizational dynamics that make it hard because when you both have probably experienced this when you're in the room with people who report to you you are guarded about how much you reveal especially around weaknesses you know blind spots things you don't know so i'm wondering where for the CEOs, the, the vice presidents, the presidents of these organizations, where is their space mm. to get it wrong and their well, space? Mm. To, Do to, they to want to get it right? Well, hold on. Th that's the key. That's the I've, key. I've experienced this firsthand. OK. Where, you know, you you're because I'm pretty transparent. <laughs> nah, I and I want everyone to chest. win. Pretty transparent. I wear everything on the, and I want everyone to win. But there's a there's a power struggle, meaning that people do not want to give up what they perceive as power That's right. over other people. Right. Because that is what makes you a quote unquote boss, as opposed to the notion as somebody that is is currently running at least three companies where people get paid by the by me. But I look at it as I'm grateful to have people help me do the things that I'm doing and help build this thing. And granted, you know, you, this power thing, I think is at the root of it because the discomfort that people feel is that if I lose this, then I'm nothing. If I don't have the ability to crush you and to make you feel smaller, to be over you, if I'm not better than you, to your point in your book, Jamar Tisby, then what am I? Toni Morrison would say, what are you without this? So this thing that we that that shows up as race, but if we remove the race, it's going to be height. If we remove that, it's probably going to be eye color. Jane Elliott proved that in one week in her class, maybe it was two days in her class. She in an all white class demonstrated how racism works with brown eyes and blue eyes. Right. It's always going to be something because people have not figured out how to be OK inside 
how to be strong and valuable inside, that they are always seeking that outside validation. And that only means if I can lord over you, then I'm valuable. And that's the problem in this world. So I think, I mean, you are nail on the head with this because even in much of our diagnosis we are we are looking at the superficial level what we're looking at is the manifestation of the brokenness that lies beneath so even in systemic structure even when we're talking about public education funding all that stuff that is all a manifestation of our collective brokenness as a nation as a political economic social entity and also our individual brokenness and so so much of what you're saying is absolutely right the 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 people who um have the tightest grips on the biggest levers of power often don't want to change and the question is how do we cultivate virtue in a society so there's more people like karen hunter who, 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 who I don't think we need that either. Hold on. Let me, let me pause yeah, you. Let me, That's gonna, whoa, that would be problematic. That would be problematic. <laughs> Stop it. You know, we're too far, oh Jamar Tisby, with that. You that ever see those be... like sci-fi movies, those time travel where you can't see your own person. It's, there's like a black hole form and everything gets <laughs> This is going to be the multiverse yeah. of madness. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah nah. <laughs> now, even <laughs> I wouldn't be, I even I see that as a problem. And I think we all <laughs> should, we shouldn't have more of anybody. We should have more of each person being more of themselves. I think that's the formula. How can we turn the volume? the leadership values that you're displaying right and and this goes like folk need therapy i'm being 100 percent honest um and it's the people who think they need it least who probably need it most oh. uh folk need communities that nurture virtue like humility and honesty and respect and and if we don't i, I don't know how it got to the point where we we hesitate to talk about these things in public right? Like it's soft or it's weak or whatever. I think this is at its core, what, 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 what was happening in, in things like the civil rights movement. And we're talking about the beloved community, right? Obviously it's working toward justice, it's working for tangible material change, but it also understood that simultaneously there has to be a humanization to counteract the dehumanization that is often prevalent in our society. Hmm. How to fight racism. Young readers edition. Jamar Tisby. Dr. Jamar Tisby is here. Um, we'll give you your full respect. You got to thank you. Um, the I just had a conversation last night with Tracy Sherrod and Nubia with Dr. Gray Carr. Mm-hmm. We were talking about Barracoon because we're reading that together. Uh, those of you who aren't familiar with Zora Neale Hurston's uh, sit down with Kasula. Kasula, the who was on that ship, the Clotilda, uh, is the story of the last black cargo, the last ship. And we were talking about the publishing industry and what they publish and why. And I'm always, you know, I was in publishing for 10 plus years. I published 30 something books, a uh, bunch of bestsellers. But I'm always mindful of what gets published and why. Yeah. And on the heels of George Floyd and the, the, the decimation of that man's life, the world was sitting down we were in a pandemic and publishers responses you know co- collectively there's a lot of p- people like you get publishing deals as a result meaning let's let's throw some money at it and let's get some books out there and teach you how to be an anti-racist teach you how to be less fragile teach you how to how how do we fight racism because we obviously have a problem so we're going to solve it this way is that is is that a little bit let's talk when we come back because I want to know the anatomy of how you got this book deal, but more importantly, you personally, your moment of like revelation, like because uh, you are a historian and also uh, you study religion. Where's God in all of this? And because there's less God, there's less God today than ever before. We start the show talking about, you know, the end of the world, and Ghostbusters jokingly. But I do think that there the, there's an unleashing of demons Mm. <laughs> on this mm. earth is a demonic force yes. that has to be dealt with and we got to call a thing a thing so cena sit tight put on yeah. your seatbelt we're gonna go I know. in we gotta do the demon thing again now i'm yeah, here we're for gonna, it yep <laughs> when, we, when we come back demons and angels with dr jamar tisby and cena gaznavi so before we left i um asked dr tisby about god and this whole journey to end racism where does God play a role or does she? So I, I, I 
I think so. I'm a person of faith. And so definitely, uh, I I'm viewing it through these lenses, but you don't have to even adhere to any particular religion to understand the religious elements of what we're seeing here. So, uh, in my understanding of Christianity, one of the fundamental teachings that we have to excavate and mine for applications is, uh, the image of God that every human being is made in God's image and likeness and therefore has inherent dignity, worth, value, infinite. And so we ought to treat each other that way. But going to the sort of political and uh, social aspects of it, one of the things that we need to be aware of is the reality of white Christian nationalism, which I contend is the greatest threat to not only the witness of the church in the United States, but to democracy itself in the United States right now. And you can see signs of white Christian nationalism all over the place, namely in the January 6th attempted insurrection. Uh, not only the religious symbolism that we saw, the, the, the crosses and whatnot, but they, they, they did prayers before, during, and after, including in uh, the chambers of Congress and prayed in Jesus' name about overturning a lawful election and we have to understand the religious ideology undergirding this. We have to understand that one of the main vectors for the inculcation of white Christian nationalism is white faith communities. And we have to find ways to interrupt that process if we are going to make, reason, make the necessary strides to preserve a constitutional democracy as we know it. Mm. Mm. Ah. Uh, we're in the season of Ramadan as well. Ramadan Mubarak to our uh, brothers and sisters who are practicing the Islamic faith. Uh, I think there's one God. If you don't believe in God, that's fine. Um, but I do think, you know, the further we move away from this notion that not that there's an all seeing powerful being that directs our lives, but that that all seeing powerful being is inside of each of us. And it's our responsibility to manifest that power, that powerful being of humanity and love, which is the foundation for all great religions, I think, is love. We have to find it in ourselves. So we can find it in other people and manifest and then, you know, let it spread that way. I think we've moved, moved so far away from that, that it, it feels almost impossible to mm. pull it together. I don't see any common ground politically, spiritually, racially, in, in anything, any place can we find common ground. The fact that we, that we could not confirm someone as seemingly beautiful inside and out and qualified as Katanji Brown Jackson that everybody that met with her said the same thing, she's a lovely person, but that we couldn't find common ground to confirm her to the Supreme Court of the United States of America was to me, everything told the yeah. picture of where we are right now. It goes back to identity, I think. Um, first, we, we, we've got to understand uh, that when we talk about something like white Christian nationalism, we're not talking about religion as it, it, it professes to be in a, in a sacred text or a holy text. Here's what Samuel Perry and Andrew Whitehead uh, said in their book, Taking America Back for God. They're two sociologists. They said, uh, Christian nationalism is an ideology that idealizes and advocates a fusion of Christianity with American civic belonging and participation. And they say, Christian with an asterisk in this sense re represents more of an ethno-cultural and political identity that denotes a specific constellation of religious affiliation, cultural values, race, and nationality. It's this idea that the, the United States was, was formed as a Christian nation and it privileges their version of Christianity, which also has all these implications for race and gender as well. But the critical part here says it is a ethno-cultural and political identity. So that when we start to dismantle the, the, the accoutrements of Christian nationalism, things like the, 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 the folks like this will do things like put the American flag in the pulpit at church. They will uh, revere the Constitution as a, as a divinely inspired document, almost on par with the Bible. They will celebrate the 4th of July as if it is a liturgical holiday and not simply a national or a political one. 
And when you start to take some of these things along with their political priorities, when you start to take those tent poles away, they don't know what's left of their identity. Mm. And what we have to do is say, there's a better way, which gets back to, you know, you talk about religion and, and, and spirituality, that there's a, there's a better identity than whiteness. And, and most people, when they hear me say whiteness, hear me say white people, as in mm. an, an individual. What I'm, what I'm talking about is the ideology of racial stratification, that if you are categorized as white, puts you on top and at the center. And what we're trying to say is there's a better identity than that. And if that's the only identity you have to cling to, then guess what? It's automatically anti-Black. It's automatically making indigenous people invisible. It's automatically making uh, people of Asian descent, uh, constant foreign and exotic. And all of those things are wrapped up with it. So we gotta find ways to communicate and teach a better identity. Jabbar, there's a, in your, your book is how to fight racism, but there's two editions. This yeah. is the, this is the, the youth edition, the young person's edition. Young reader's right? edition. Young reader's edition. Can and you tell me, because I was looking at it, I always like to buy books while, while Karen has authors on, and I, I, I'm i halfway through Ellie Mistal's book, and so I was just going to get yours, and I'd love to know the difference between these two yeah. editions. Oh, it's I, I'm so glad you asked that. So How to Fight Racism is a, it, the value is this. I give, it, it's super practical. So every chapter is going to have action steps, but the real value is this the arc of racial justice framework that I offer. See, the problem is this. One of the things that people like me who talk about race do, we, we're really good on the diagnosis. We can tell you what's wrong as long as the day is, you know? What, what we tend to, to spend less time on is what to do about it. And then even when we do talk about what to do about it, it's this bullet point list. It, try this, that, the other. It, and our brains are wired for efficiency. That meaning, If you give me a bullet point list of things that are only tangentially related, chances are I'm not even going to remember them, let alone take action on them. So mm. you get to, to the end of a book about race and you're like, wow, that was really enlightening. And then guess what? We go about business as usual. What we need is something that our brains can grasp, are super efficient, want to simplify things brains can grasp and that we can carry with us to take action on. That's where the arc of racial justice comes in. It's an acronym that stands for awareness, relationships, commitment, awareness, relationships, commitment. I think like the three legs of a stool, you'll need all three to build a stable foundation on which to build your racial justice work. So awareness is everything that we're doing right now. It's listening to this show. It's reading the book, How to Fight Racism. It's, it's watching documentaries. It's everything you do to understand the, 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 racial, the racial operating system in our society. But that's not enough. We can't just have big heads about it. We also have to have big hearts about it. This is the part, Karen, that we've been talking about, the humanity of it all, the virtues and the values of it all. Because fundamentally, what fighting racism is about is about the flourishing of real human beings, of real people. And, and, and oh, let us never forget that. It's not about pursuing some cause or crusade in an abstraction. What we're talking about is affecting the lives of real people, which means we have to cultivate relationships mm -hmm. with people who are different from us, who can teach us something, who we can follow, who we can learn from. And then lastly, it's not enough just to have big hearts. That's what the evangelicals say. Well, let's just be friends. That's what a lot of white people say in an individualistic understanding of racism. Well, some of my best friends are black. That's not enough. We also have to work on the systemic level. That's where commitment comes in. And by commitment, I don't just mean staying the course. I mean, committing to change the systems, the structures, the laws, the policies mm. well, that's that go where, beyond. Yeah. That's where it's going to be a problem. Dr. Jamar Tisby is here. He's got, uh, of course, How to Fight Racism and then How to Fight Racism, Young Readers Edition. In order for anyone, I, I alluded to this before we went to break about publishing, you know, publishers of all, the, there's a rash of books that are on a bestsellers list by Black authors. And Ibram Kendi came back because Ted Cruz's ass went out there and brought the <laughs> anti-racist baby to the, <laughs> to the, uh, to the confirmation hearings. Um, somebody would have to want to read your book. Do you know what I'm saying? Which means, you know, like roughly 30% of our listeners identify as white. Some of them are trolls, but most of them are not. They want 
a different world for their children, for themselves. Maybe they're in relationship, maybe that, you know, something, you know, but they're not just tuning in for kicks and giggles. They actually want to roll up their sleeves and participate in the future of this world. But that is still not 90%. You know what I'm saying? That's still not 100% of the people out there who could listen uh, of the 40, 50 million people that are subscribed to SiriusXM and the, the podcast. But that says to me, you know, we have all over the country these laws being passed by state legis- legislators to remove books, to remove any kind of curriculum that might possibly give the children a knowledge of self and the actual foundational history of the country or the history, period. So we're doing, we're going in the opposite direction. In order for somebody to, in order for this thing to change, people are going to have to willfully say something's wrong and I want to fix it. And I don't think enough people are there because too many benefit from the wrongness. The wrongness benefits right now, the majority of this country. And why would they give that up? Mm. Who's going to give up the privilege to be able to walk freely in the world, not even have to think about race Mm. or racism, even watching George Floyd. That's still something that happened to them. Mm. It'll never happen to my child. So I'm horrified. That was awful. Like the dogs and the hoses during the civil rights movement that got people off their couches but the vast majority of Americans, even black Americans, didn't weren't riding with King. They weren't right. they weren't rocking with him. They thought he was a problem. He's he's going to make white people lynch us and stuff. Stop agitating. They wanted him to stop and sit down somewhere. So what's different now? You know, except the young people, I think. But they're not being educated. So I don't know. It's like a vicious cycle really that is. requires more of people than I think people. I mean, hell, we can't get people to stop eating McDonald's. <laughs> So something that's literally no, no disrespect, McDonald's, but, you know, all of them, literally, we are dying <laughs> because of fast food and, and sugar. And we won't do that for our health. Mm, mm, mm. I don't know. It's. um. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I, I think part of the problem is we don't realize uh, I love this phrase that King used in his I have a dream speech, the fierce urgency of now. Uh, one of the things that I keep trying to convey to people is now is the time. Now is the opportunity. Now is our chance to make change and, and a difference. It's it's not going to happen by itself. And by all indications, it's not going to get any easier tomorrow than it is today and may, in fact, get harder. And so part of what I try to do is impress upon people that you got one historical moment to live through. And you are making history now. And I tell people, a lot of folks say, well, if I was alive in the, in, in the civil rights movement, I would have marched with King, I would have boycotted, I would have picketed. And what I tell them is what you're doing now is exactly what you would have done then. Mm. So what legacy do you want to have? What story do you want to write? So it's impressing upon people the urgency. The other way I try to do it is, is by telling them the history. What, one of the things that catalyzed me was reading the in-depth, detailed historical account of what has happened to Black people in this nation. So it is not enough to have this impressionistic view that things were bad, slavery was bad, Jim Crow, lynching was bad. But you've got to hear about the lynching of Luther and Mary Holbert in Mississippi and Sunflower County in the Jim Crow era when they took a corkscrew to these living people and tortured them. I won't go into detail, but that's is this the in kind Southern of Horrors. Stuff. Is this part of Southern Horrors, Ida B. Wells? It's uh, not in, uh, it, it might be in that one. The because where, she where, has some horrific yeah, detailed uh, Ida B. Wells, Southern Horrors. There's thousands of stories like that. I live 25 minutes from one of the worst race massacres that people have never heard about. You, you've probably heard about it because you're intelligent, studied uh, historian, um, in these streets, but it's called the Elaine Massacre. It I've never in, heard of the Elaine Massacre. So tell us about the Elaine chilling. Massacre, Dr. Tisby. Elaine, Elaine spelled like a person's name. That's right. You know, in the South, they're going <laughs> to change the pronunciation. It's the Elaine Massacre. The Elaine Massacre. What part of Mississippi? This is in Arkansas on the Mississippi Arkansas. River in Phillips County. And uh, it was in 1919. Red summer. That red exactly. summer. That's right. And nobody, it, 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 nobody knows about it. It was in the fall. Um, what happened was this. There was a bumper crop of cotton. Cotton was going for sky high prices. Of course, 
uh, labor exploitation continued after the abolition of slavery and it took the form of sharecropping. So what happened was black sharecroppers were organizing a union to get fair prices for the cotton, which if they got, would have catapulted them into financial independence. They could have bought their own farms, their own equipment. They wouldn't have had to work for the white man on the plantation anymore. Well, of course, white people didn't want this. So what happened was they were meeting at a church late at night after a long day's work. They posted guards out, black guards with, with, with rifles, because they knew there could be trouble. Sure enough, two white men came. Uh, they were in law enforcement. We don't know exactly what happened. When a shootout occurred, one of the white men was killed, another was injured. The wire went out the next day that said Negro insurrection. You can look at the papers from 1919, and it says in big capital so letters. Pa pa Negro pause right there before you finish the story, because I mm -hmm. think it's important. Jamar Tisby is here. Cena Gaznavi is here. There was no internet. There was no no cell phone. That's right. The arm of the lever of information came through the media, through mm. the newspaper. And I, I'm just thinking about Ida B. Wells, Southern Horrors. Most of the conversations around that that sparked these massacres came through a newspaper. Came through a newspaper. Media disinformation, media misinformation was the lever that was pulled to enact violence on black people, right? That's right. Is that what you're saying? Right. It was a newspaper article Absolutely. that said this happened because when we see it in a newspaper, it, it's true. It's true. Newspapers right? were agents of some of the worst racist propaganda for decades, decades. You can go back and look at old records of the Clarion Ledger, which is the paper of record in Mississippi. The most outright blatant racist segregate, segregationist BS that you could imagine. And yeah, it was through the media at this time. And so basically what it's the old trope. This was happening in the antebellum period too. Whenever black people try to gain a modicum of power and self-independence, self-reliance, uh, uh, the, the lie went out that, well, black people are trying to kill all the white people and take over. And that's what happened. Uh, that's the message that went out. And so white people came in from Mississippi, Tennessee, other parts of Arkansas, descended on this tiny sharecropping community, and for three days and nights proceeded to indiscriminately kill up to 200 Black women, men, and children. And here's the thing. We don't know about it. One, because of the obfuscation of this history in general. And two, my theory, my hunch, we know about Tulsa. We know about Black Wall Street. That was urban and it was middle class to wealthy. What do you do when it's rural and poor? So there's a whole other wrinkle here on the urban and rural, on the class issue, even within the Black community. So these kinds of things are the, are the histories that when I learned it, I'm like, oh, heck no, we got to do something. I like what you said about giving people another option for themselves, right? Um, the Toni Morrison clip that keeps running around in my head. I hope we can just play it so that we can listen to it. Uh, Smith, if, if you can pull that Toni Morrison clip, that would be really helpful. Go ahead. If the racist white person, I don't mean the person who is examining his consciousness and so on, doesn't understand that he or she is also a race it's also constructed, it's also made, and it also has some kind of serviceability. But when you take it away, I take your race away. And there you are all strung out and all you got is your little self. And what is that? What are you without racism? Are you any good? Are you still strong? Are you still smart? Are you still like yourself? If you can only be tall because somebody's on their knees, then you have a serious problem. And my feeling is white people have a very, very serious problem. And they should start thinking about what they can do about it. Take me out of it. But take me out of it. Mm -hmm. I've been deploying a strategy this year. I was trying to figure out how not to say racism because those are buzzwords, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't use CRT, you know, how to have conversations so this uh i think it was yesterday day before yesterday somebody called them called me a racist um <laughs> which you know made me giggle so i asked define that for me couldn't do it 
there's been a half a dozen times that people called up as a white man, as white. And I was, what makes you a white man? Mm. What makes you white? What is white culture? Mm. It's stumping. And I'm, I'm going to keep doing it. And y'all should know already, like, be ready. Like, I'm looking for a good answer. I'm looking for a good answer to that question because if you, you know, the brain has to find an answer to a question. So I'm like, if we can just ask every time someone, I'm a white, what makes you white? What is white? What is white culture? It's American. Okay, so I'm not an American. <laughs> well, and I know the answer in their head, even though they might not say it out of their mouths. Right. Seeing is not American. You're not American. I'm not American to them, right? So they've, I, so because we're not Americans and anything that they do after that, they're absolved from. But if you flip it around, what is white? Why are you an American? Is it because you're white? So then what is white? What is white? What is what does it mean to be white? That's it. If they can, right. if they can't answer that, as Tony Morrison said, so what are you? What's it's serviceable for you to be white? There is a value to your whiteness that gives you entree, and you all know it. You know it. You know it. You know it. But if you don't have that, are you any good? Mm. What's good about you without that? And if you aren't developing those things, if you can, if you can strip away the notion of your whiteness and develop the things about you that make you you, then perhaps we can move forward as a humanity group of people. I'm not wanting to say a country because this is global. We watched Africans be uh, treated poorly in Ukraine under the, the stress of a war. They made a distinction between Ukrainians and black people who were there as immigrants. And even the countries taking in the Ukrainians took them Poland, took in the white Ukrainians, but treated the black and, you know, same people run away from the same horrors mm. differently. This is a global problem. We see it in England. We see it in France. Unless you can climb a building and save a baby and mm. you're black, you're not getting the same treatment as a white person in France in England in Australia, in any place in this in this world, and Russia. So let's put them in it because there's a lot of black people caping for Russia. Stop, stop it, stop it, stop wow. it. So this this whiteness is an infection throughout the globe, and it's made up. So if y'all can't define it, then why do you hold on to it? Ooh. And if you're holding on to something, is des literally destroying humanity. You're willing to burn down the whole house. I think they are willing to burn down the whole house. There's this kill my neighbor's cow <laughs> mentality. I don't have a cow. You have a cow. I don't want you to be more successful than I. So I'm going to kill your cow instead of work to get a cow for myself. I don't even want you to have a cow. I feel like they're willing to burn this whole thing down. That's right. We saw it January 6th. Exactly. Then to let any, <laughs> anybody come up not recognizing that what Cena's parents went through to get to this country where any immigrant family go I watched a man die in the water with his child under his arm to get here most of us aren't willing to walk 100 miles and flip-flops to go somewhere what are you running away from that you're willing to do that work for peanuts be just you know put upon in another country anybody that's come through that they're gonna be stronger than you because you ain't been through nothing Let's not even talk about the 400 years. And, and there's groups of people that will talk about their suffering and it makes them strong because it does. So if you're not participating in anything that's going to give you any kind of struggle, expect to get your ass whooped on all fronts. That's what that's what happens. You ain't been through nothing. So, yeah, I'm sorry, Jamar couldn't get on the basketball team and play, but you got a PhD. I'm sorry. You know, there's other things. So. I don't know. I don't know about this. Uh, the people willing to give up the thing, the very thing that makes them them because they're not willing to do the work. As I mentioned, they're not willing to get off sugar. Why would they give up whiteness? So I think going back to what she said about not enough people being involved. One of the things that has to happen is this thing needs to be intergenerational. Mm. So it's too late when we're adults to get started. What we need to do is help our young people understand this struggle. And I think one of the great values of a book like How to Fight Racism, Young Readers Edition, and even the adult version is giving young people a sense of their own agency. 
this is one of the things that that racism and white supremacy does is it is is it blinds us to our own ability to influence the world. Now, obviously, we can't do everything, but if there's something that is wrong that we think needs to be right, we can do some things. And if we can teach our young people, hey, you have agency. When you see somebody, somebody being mistreated, when you see something that's not fair, you don't just have to accept it as that's the way the world is. You can be part of making it better. And even if that's all you get from any of these books, these conversations, is that you have the ability to impact the world in small but significant ways, then I think we've done something important. We got more work to do, but we've done something important. Mm. And that's how we begin to build. It's going to take a long time. But what has to happen is we exert constant pressure for forward progress, knowing, here's the thing, knowing we will face resistance. That's what this whole anti-CRT crusade is about. That's what this whole uh, reactionary far-right movement is about, is that they saw things changing. They saw the markers of their identity uh, come under scrutiny. They saw progress being made and they pushed back. We better not expect that this thing's going to happen without a fight. Guess who's willing to fight? <laughs> Guess who's battle <laughs> ready? 866-801-8255. Uh, Jamar Tisby is here.